what did we talk about last time? Roman. Six seal. Six yes. Terror. Terror. Good. Roman. Uh, boy, I'm bad with names. <laughs> I'm like off by one or two people. Garrett. The uh, earthquakes and then the mountains and buildings of that place and the uh, accidents going Yeah. All kinds of crazy stuff happened. Come on, just read Revelation chapter 6. You'll catch up. Um, and uh, we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 7. Yes, we talk about, talked about the sixth seal and how God sends terror on the earth. And it's so bad that it, at the end of it, people actually... Um, are crying out for the rocks and the hills to fall on them to hide them from the wrath of God. <coughs> and the, the, the anger of the land at the sinful world around us. And we don't ever want to forget that God isn't some cuddly teddy bear that's okay with however we want to live and it's fine and it's all good. No, God loves us dearly. And Romans 3.16 says that. God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. But for those who reject the Son, then comes the angry part. In time, God eventually has had enough of people rebelling against. I mean, imagine if you made a way for wicked people to be free from their sin and to spend eternity with you in heaven, and they just thumbed their nose at you. So whatever. We don't care. Well, that's what happens. That's what leads to the sixth seal. That leads to all this stuff happening in Revelation. And the thing is that I am convinced if we as the church don't teach the book of Revelation, we are leaving out one whole side of who Jesus is. We always hear about Jesus, the hippie dude who loved everybody and walked around in sandals and taught everybody. But... And, and even in that, you, people tend to ignore when he made a whip and drove the money changers out of the temple twice. And, and he always was in the face of the Pharisees and calling them on their evil and their hypocrisy and their arrogance. And here, just like then, he's not willing to put up with sin, but in Revelation we find out just how serious sin is when Jesus comes back and kicks tail of all those who have refused his gift of salvation those who continue to rebel against him. So we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1 here. He says, after this, after this being the breaking of the sixth seal, he says, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth, or on the sea, or on any tree. Now, some people try to say that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat. Because it says the four corners of the earth, and yet this is an idiom that's used all over the place throughout history. We can see this repeated again, not just by those who believe the earth is flat, but even the U.S. Marine Corps in one of their recruiting stations. I was watching this uh, pastor who's in his 70s. He said they used to have this, this slogan that they are in the four corners of the earth, the U.S. Marine Corps. You know, sign up, help us keep the four corners of the earth safe. And he said, does that mean the U.S. Marine Corps thinks the earth is flat? No. It means that it's a saying, it's an idiom. It's just expressing the idea of the whole earth everywhere. The other thing is actually in the original language, um, the inference here is the four points of the compass, which is north, south, east, and west. So he's saying these angels have been given authority to harm the earth, but they're told to wait just a minute. Now, you remember last week how I talked about how the, the Eastern mindset doesn't quite see things like we do. In the West, we're very, we want things linear. We go one, two, three, four, five. And in the East, they kind of go one, seven, six, four, three, five. They, the idea is what's most important to them is the spiritual impact of the spiritual lesson especially in Eastern mindset, biblical writings. John, the author here, is very much of an Eastern mindset. And he has these visions, and he just puts them down as they come to him. He doesn't try and structure or reorder them or anything. And so I actually think that this is one of those times here, the beginning of chapter 7, that's a little bit 
out of chronological order in the way that Revelation is laid out. Um, and it's tough to prove. You can argue the point either way. I'm just trying to be open with you guys so you understand that especially uh, books written by people from the Jewish world, their mindset is different. So we need to be careful because some people have come up with all kinds of strange teachings based on trying to see a chronology and things where their mindset, they don't care about chronology. They care, uh, not nearly as much as we do, I should say, they care more about the spiritual importance of what is being said and the impact that the structure will make on the reader. And so he starts off with the six seals, and then we come to this, where these four angels are told to hang on just a second. Don't let the winds, and you think about wind. Wind is a very destructive force. You guys have probably seen tornadoes, or at least a tornado on TV, and the footage, and, or a hurricane, and seen like the, the reporter standing out in the hurricane, like leaning into the wind. Oh, I'm live on the beach! And, I'm, and of course, every sane person is going, get in the hotel, what is wrong with you, you know? Well, those scenes are a reminder of just how damaging wind can be. And so the idea is that they're holding back the judgments of God that are about to break out on the earth like a huge hurricane. They're about to release this judgment. And they're told, wait just a second. Hold on, not so fast. We got, we got some stuff to do here before you can do your business. And uh, this reminds me, and this is point to live by number one, that God is ultimately in control of all of nature. He is in charge, and he does what he wants. Sometimes it can feel like God is out of control. Like, what in the world is going on here? You know, Parkersburg got hit by a tornado a couple of years ago, and, and a number of people died, and, and when things like that happen, it can be like, God, what, what is going on here? But God is, is in control. And God can stop. And, and again, in this instance, it's used as a metaphor for God's judgment, holding back the four winds, but it also is a reminder whether it's the four winds of God's judgment on earth or Jesus calming the waters in the boat when he was with the disciples and he was taking a nap and they were freaking out and he's like, hey, waves and winds, shut up, I'm taking a nap. And they will stop. And his disciples are freaked out. What kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? That's the mighty God that we serve. That mighty God one day is going to break out in anger against those who rebelled against him. Okay, so, and I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun and having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, it's interesting here. Uh, we find them sealing somebody on the forehead. A seal here has all kinds of different meanings and purposes and uses. Like sometimes you seal up, uh, for one, one of the practical ones that comes to my mind is they have a little lead seal sometimes they'll put on a semi-trailer. When they're hauling something of great value and they want to make sure it doesn't get stolen, They'll put this little seal on the back. You can see it. It's not a padlock, but once you hook it on there, the only way to get it off is to break it and destroy it. And so if the truck driver was to sneak in the back of his truck in route, they would know it because that little lead seal would be damaged or destroyed or missing. And in this case, and it's to protect the contents of that trailer. And here, in this case, these people, these servants of God, are going to be sealed on the forehead to say that God is protecting them in a special and a unique way. And ultimately, God protects all of us. But this is a unique set of circumstances in a very unique time in human and world history. God is saying, these, these are my guys. These are my servants. I'm watching over. 
So our second point to live by is even in the chaos and the evil of the end times, there is still uh, there will still be faithful servants of Jehovah. Jehovah is one of these specific names for God mentioned in the Bible. We don't often, often we just call him God or we call him Lord, but that's the name, one of the names that he chose for himself. And so I like to remind people of that, and for some of you this may be the first time you've heard it, but Jehovah God or Yahweh God is the, the actual name of the God of the Bible, or God the Father as we were refer to him. And so even in the end time, there, even in all of the evil and all the chaos and all the mess, there are going to be these servants of the living God. And they're going to have a special seal of protection. Now there's another group of people that are also going to be sealed. And we're going to talk about them a little bit later on in Revelation. But keep this in the back of your mind. There's two groups of people that are sealed in the book of Revelation. Keep your eyes open. The second group is coming. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, from the tribe of Judah. Okay, so we'll stop here. 144,000. There are how many tw tribes 12. in Israel? 12 tribes in Israel. And 144 divided by 12 is 12,000. Yeah. So there's going to be... According to what this is saying, there's going to be 12,000 men from each tribe of Israel who are going to be faithful servants and followers of Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Jesus was a Jew. I guess you could say he still is a Jew. He lived as a Jew on earth, but sadly, the Jewish leadership of his day rejected him as Messiah, and the vast majority of the nation rejected him as well. And even to this day, the vast majority of Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the one who would come to forgive their sins. They don't believe in Him. But these 144,000 people that are sealed by God, they do believe in Jesus, and they are His servants. Gerard, you hear Someone told me that there are only 144,000 yeah, that person was probably a Jehovah's Witness. And this is one of those things that the Jehovah's Witness Church teaches. They said that they were Jehovah's Witnesses and that they were the only true church and you had to get into heaven you had to be a Jehovah's Witness. And um, they were the 144,000 sealed by God. They had a little problem because in 1935, the 144,000 according to their reckoning, had already been filled. So they had to come up with something to do with the other people who now couldn't go to heaven because they're only the 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses could go to heaven. So from 1935 on, your only hope was to be the best Jehovah's Witness ever and that one of those Jehovah's Witnesses that were already the 144,000 uh, uh, fell into sin and then you could replace them. Otherwise, you were stuck on a new earth. Um, but here's the thing. The Bible says clearly who these people are. These people are Jews from the tribe of Israel, or the tribes of Israel. They are not Jehovah's Witnesses. They are not, and, and there's several other Christ, uh, so-called Christian cults who have claimed this same status as, oh, we're the special servants of God and everybody else is wrong. And, and sorry, but that's just heresy. That is not true. That is not what the Bible is saying. Yes, Aaron. Um, I saw something on TV a while ago that said that um, a growing uh, really number of Jewish people are starting to turn Jews. There is a yes, there is a movement of uh, a, a movement of God among His people to draw their hearts to Him, and there are more and more of them turning to Jesus. And as the day gets closer, that is going to even continue. We're going to see more and more and more Jews turn to Jesus. But I, I think we're going to see people all around the world turn to Him. I don't know that... Uh, I, I know this, not everyone will. And what's going to happen is you're going to see more, I think, of a split where those who 
that don't believe in Jesus are very much anti-Jesus, very much against Christianity. And those who believe in Him, who really truly believe in Him, are going to be more on fire for Jesus than ever. Because they're going to have to be to survive the persecution, to survive the ridicule, and in some parts of the world, the death threats and even the martyrdom that's going to happen as people refuse to turn their back on Jesus and may actually pay the ultimate price. All right, so he goes on and he lists from each tribe. There's some intriguing things about this list we're going to talk about in a second. We'll buzz through it here real quick, and then we'll go to some uh, notes here. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. And from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Anybody see anything unique about that list of the 12 tribes of Israel? That was the 12,000. What? They all say 12,000. Okay, that's a commonality between each one. What else? Some of you might not have caught it. And I didn't at first. I was like, hey, 12,000, 12,000, 12,000, 12,000. But there's actually some uniqueness in this list. We're going to watch a brief video. Um, I was doing research for this message and came across this and went, huh, that is really intriguing. So, names have meaning, and you may not even know the meaning of your name. Some of us do. Um, but in the Jewish culture, names were very important. And so, you know, you... You, some of you guys may have heard of the prayer of Jabez before. Jabez means pain. Can you imagine living your whole life with the name pain? Come here, little pain. Oh, you are such a pain. You, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's actually horrible what his parents did to him, what his mother did to him. He was, I guess, a hard birth, and so she named him pain. Well, that's one example of, I know, I'm like, really? Just, he did, it wasn't even his fault. It's not like he chose to be painful at birth. But... Each name in the Bible has a meaning, and they, so this Bible uh, teacher, preacher, did a study on what the names in this list mean, and he's going to explain that for us here, what each name means. Sort of putting the names together in the order that they're listed here in Revelation is interesting. A praiser of God, viewing the sun. Blessed ones, wrestling with forgetfulness, but hearing and obeying the word. They hold to the reward of a heavenly dwelling. In addition, they have become sons of God's right hand. And so the order in which the names are given, when you give the interpretation of the names, it, it uh, is, is interesting. And of course, if the names were in any other order, it wouldn't make any sense. And so uh, evidently the Spirit of God was uh, directing uh, the order of the names or the tribes uh, given who are sealed, and they go through uh, a portion, at least, of the Great Tribulation. They will be 144,000. There's a reason. Now, there were two names left out. And um, the name of uh, Dan, one of the tribes, is not mentioned. And neither is the name of... Dude, it's normally Manasseh, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim is left out. So there's two tribes left out. and. This goes back to, again, I believe, two things. Number one, those two tribes were two 
uh, Bible scholars tell us were two of the most prolific worshipers of idols. So in some ways, they are left out of the list, I think, for that. But also, because of the artistic um, and theistic message John's trying to get across, that the Jewish nation will finally turn to God. These 144,000 will kind of be almost like a first fruits of the whole nation of Israel that's left after a bunch of them die in the wars and earthquakes and stuff. First fruits to God. Those who are sold out to following Him. And again, there are Jewish people all throughout time who have believed that this group is a special group chosen by God. And uh, like, for example, Benjamin, the last one on the list, he means, his name means son of my right hand. And so that's why they're in a certain order. This is the only time in the Bible that the tribe of Judah comes first, which is, they say, really fitting because this book is about the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb of God. Those two contrasting pictures of who Jesus was and who Jesus will be and always has been. And so it's interesting that in the name of, in the way of writing this out, talking about the Jews becoming followers of the true God and finally being sons of his right hand and all that stuff, it's just intriguing. Now, the tribe of Dan is also is the first one mentioned when God says that when Jesus is back on earth ruling for a thousand years, Dan is the first one to get their allotment of land and blessing in the millennium in the millennial kingdom. So it's interesting that even in God's mercy, the tribe and uh, um, Ephraim is also mentioned uh, in that list. So even in God's mercy, those who have been the most rebellious against God, when they turn to Him in repentance, He still shows them love. And so we have a little find it challenge because I wanted to show you one other reason, one other proof that the Jehovah's Witnesses take on who the 144,000 is, is just plain <coughs> dead wrong. And I want to show you from the Bible some more details about who these guys are. So I want everybody to have a Bible. I want you to get ready to open it up. Set. Go. Oh, it's a two-way tie. Okay. And another. <laughs> and another angel yeah. came out of the temple, crying out, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put him in your sickle and read for the hour and. I think you might have the wrong chapter, or I might have the wrong chapter. Fourteen, one through five. Then I saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion. Oh, I thought they said 15. Okay, you have to sit down. Alright. Okay. Then I saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name, and his father's name written on their foreheads. Alright. And then, Aaron, once you finish out the verses. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of a harp is playing the harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the others. No one could declare the song except for the 144,000 who had been purchased from her. Okay, you need to read louder. <clears throat> These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaps. These are the ones who follow the land. Whoever, where, these have been purchased from one another as first fruits to God and to them. No lie was found in the Okay, did you guys notice that? That sometimes the Bible does use uh, euphemisms, and like in the Bible, one thing that the Bible often says is it'll call something mountains, and mountains are actually in the Middle Eastern mindset, are a representation of leaders. And even Mahmoud Ahmadinejad talks about um, Islam will overcome 
Thank you. The mountains of the earth. He says, he even today, the leader of Iran, uses mountains as a, a, a simile or as a, a metaphor for leadership. Sometimes the Bible uses metaphors, but the 144,000 are not a metaphor. And you can usually tell that when it gets really detailed and really specific. And so what are some of the specifics about this 144,000? Descriptors from there. Aaron? They are blameless. They're blameless. What else? They don't lie. They don't lie. They have God's name written on their forehead. They have God's name written on their forehead. It actually says that they are... Men who have never known women. These guys are virgins, 144,000 of them. They have kept themselves chaste or pure. And so once you get that kind of detail about something in the Bible, you can rest very surely on the fact that this is not a simile. These are not a metaphor, I mean. These are actually 144,000 human men from each tribe of Israel. And so next time a Jehovah's Witness comes knocking at your door, ask them if they're married and show them these verses. Oh, I'm sorry. Number one, if you're a woman, sorry, it's men. Nothing personal, but that's what God said. Number two, it's men who are virgins. Oh, I'm sorry you're married. You can't be one of the 144,000. You lose. You know, I mean, that, and, you know, I, I know I'm kind of joking around with you guys, but but it, it actually breaks my heart because there's some really sincere people that think they're serving God in that in the Jehovah's Witness movement, but they've bought into a lie. Or Mormons. They have not, and Mormonism and other ones too, they... They are not truly following the Jesus of the Bible. They are following someone else's cardboard cutout of who Jesus is. They're knockoff, they're ripoff of who Jesus is. It's like you go to the, the mall and you see the poster of the you know life size cutout of some Justin Bieber or you know some other singer. Um, it's not the real Justin Bieber. It's 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 a knockoff. It's a it's a one-sided, flat reproduction, and that's what Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and all of those groups that are twisting the Bible. That's what they have, and that's what they hold to, and it breaks my heart because the one-sided knockoff Jesus does not lead to heaven. We want the real Jesus. We want the Jesus of the Bible. And you guys, this should be a wake-up call to each of you that you need to know the Bible so that when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking on your door, you know where to take them. Take them to Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5. And show them the list and say, have you ever lied? Oh, man, I'm sorry. You can't be in the 144,000 either. And neither can any of the people that your organization says lived before 1935 and says they were gone. Because it says no lie is found on their lips. They're men, they're Jewish, they've never been married or had sex. Aaron? You could ask them to tell you something about the Holmes Witnesses or whatever it is called and uh well, you just like there. Yeah, well, I, and remember, in anything, the only thing, anytime we're witnessing to somebody, the, the thing that really shines through is when we love. So make sure no matter what you say, that you do it in love, out of sadness of heart for somebody that's following a lie. So be real careful that you don't try and be too cute and too funny or too mocking of them because we really want is them to come to the true Jesus. Throw that cardboard cut out away. Burn it in the fire. Come to the real, living Jesus Christ of the Bible. Who loves you and wants you to spend eternity with you. So our third point to live by. Have you ever 
been sealed by God's Holy Spirit. This goes back to the 144,000. They were sealed on their forehead. Now, the Bible talks about how that each and every one of us is sealed by God when we are saved. When you and I put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and He seals each and every one of us. And He says, this one's mine. I've got the proof right here. The seal of the Holy Spirit has been stamped on their heart. Now, we, you and I, cannot ever be part of the 144,000 <coughs> We, and unless you're Jewish, unless you've never told a lie, unless you remain a virgin, and unless you, the other thing that is a real problem is, they follow Jesus Christ on the earth wherever he goes. Jesus has to be back with these people at some point to fulfill his prophecy, his vision. <coughs> yes, Eric? How could there be anybody who would uh, be part of that thing? Because Nobody alive? Well... Nobody would know that right now because they have to be following him around on the earth when he's here, when he comes back. So um, now the sealing happens before the sealing of them to God happens before he comes back on the earth. But once he does, they're drawn to him like a magnet, you know, like moth to a flame or iron to a magnet. They they are there when he comes back to the earth to rule. And they follow him wherever he goes. But I hope you guys understand that knowing the Bible is so important. In this day and in this age, when so many people sort of say they know the Bible and say they love Jesus, but they teach things that aren't true, teach things that aren't biblical, you need to be ready to give it an answer, and you need to know what you believe so that you can say, hey, you know, I, I don't want to ruin your day. I'm not trying to make fun of you. Let's look at Revelation 14 when that Jehovah's Witness shows up at your door. Take them right to the heart of the issue and just say, this is just one of the false teachings of the church that you're following. Please, please, for the sake of your eternal soul, please leave that false <coughs> religion. And come to the true Jesus of the Bible. Not because we're smarter than they are, not because we're better people than they are, because that's what the Bible teaches. And when you learn the Bible and you know the Bible, you won't put up with anything but the truth of the Bible. And that's why it's so important that you know that for yourself. Because I won't be there when that Jehovah's Witness tries to tell you stuff that sounds biblical and they quote a whole bunch of verses in the Bible to you and they try to get you to agree with them and all of a sudden you're like, oh, maybe that, oh, maybe that makes sense. You need to know it for yourself. And the Holy Spirit is given to us by God to seal our hearts, to be a stamp from God, a spiritual stamp. The whole spiritual world can see when we believed in Jesus Christ, it's like God stamps in our heart with the Holy Spirit and says, this one is mine. I choose this person. He places a stamp of the Holy Spirit on us. In us. That's how you and I, we're kind of like brothers, if you will, of the 144,000. We are not the 144,000. I think I've gone over that enough to help you understand that. But we share a common Savior. We all love the same Jesus. Those of us who are true Christians, we have the same Holy Spirit living in us. We are the sons and the daughters of God. What an awesome privilege that is. You and I get to live that out every day. Some days it's hard. Some days it'll lead to being made fun of. This is an honor. And one day the entire world is going to see God says, this one is my servant. Even though you made fun of him, even though 
You know, they held fast to their faith. And they wouldn't give in and wouldn't believe the lies that you tried to teach them. This one is mine and has been. And will forever be mine. That's the awesome privilege we have as believers in Jesus Christ. The God of the universe stamps our hearts with the Holy Spirit and says, this one is mine. So have you ever had your heart stamped by the Holy Spirit? This happens when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and then you live your life to follow Him each day of your life. I want to challenge you. If you haven't done that yet, Feel free to ask questions. Talk to me. Talk to Jim. We'd love to answer any questions you have. But I want to encourage you. This is the most important decision of your life. And to miss this or mess this up and to follow a false teacher, whether it's your own life and your own values and just saying, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm not practicing. That doesn't cut it. Jesus didn't call people to sit in church. Jesus didn't call people to say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I really don't care. No, Jesus said, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Rich young ruler comes to him, and Jesus tells him, he says, what do I have? Good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, and why do you call me good? No one's good but God himself. Pointing out that all of us are sinners and are in need of a Savior. And Jesus, it says in the Bible, Jesus looked at the man with love. Jesus looked at the man and loved him. Jesus said, you've kept the commandments, but one thing you lack. He basically put his finger right on the guy's sin problem. He said, you love your stuff more than you love God. Go sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor. Come follow me. And the man went away sad because he was very rich. He wouldn't let go of his stuff. It's not easy to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. The meaning of that was not that you and I today have to sell everything we have, but we have to face the fact everything we have is God's, and when He says we need to give it up, we need to give it up. But we love nothing more than God, more than His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And our highest goal in life, that's what it means be a Christian. And that is the physical evidence, the lived out evidence that you have been sealed in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Have you been sealed? Ask yourself that. Maybe you have, but maybe you've slipped up, maybe you've gotten into some sin. You need to repent and get your heart right. Tonight, before you go to bed, when you get home, I challenge you, spend some good quality time with God. Ask God where you're at. God, have, have I been sealed by your Holy Spirit? Am I yours? And if the answer is yes, God, is there stuff in my life I need to get rid of? want to follow you everywhere you want me to go. These 144,000 that followed Jesus everywhere he went are a great example for us. Are you following Jesus everywhere he wants you to go? Are you holding back? Are you hiding? Are you not sharing the gospel with people that desperately need it? Because you're afraid. What does God want you to be doing to follow him? today, tomorrow, the rest of your life? It's a question that only you can answer. I can't answer that for you. But you'll never answer it if you stay busy, if you always have your earbuds in, if you don't spend time and just slow down and just say, okay, God, I love you. Guide me. God, I want everything you have for me. Fill me up. Seal me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power it takes to stand up for you, to be a witness for you. 
follow the example of these people. To be totally sold out to the Lion of the tribe of Judah, our Savior, Jesus Christ.